Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker, and welcome to today's lecture focusing on our Cartesian coordinates as we apply Newtonian particle kinetics in dynamics. And so a Cartesian coordinate system is one of our three coordinate systems we talked about in the previous chapter. In addition to Cartesian, we have a tangent normal. We also have a polar coordinate system, or R theta. So today, focusing on Cartesian, we can write Newton's second law, sum of forces, with respect to x and y coordinates. Notice that both the force and also the acceleration, they're written in this version as a scalar value. The reason they're written as a scalar value is that we are saying with this notation, we're isolating 100% of the acceleration in the x and the force in the x into this equation. So it doesn't need to be a vector equation because we know the direction of these terms. And then the y version of this equation, of course, is the sum of forces in the y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. Now, if you worked a three-dimensional problem, of course, you could add in a third dimension, which is z. In dynamics, uh, we pretty much stick to two dimensions, and so we'll leave it at that. And we know that these acceleration terms are related to time rates of change of position and velocity. Right? We could write that the acceleration in the x direction is equal to the second time derivative of the position, right? x double dot. I could also write that, that this is equal to my x velocity single dot, right? Remember that all these dots are time derivatives. Let me just write that here. Dot is defined as a d dt, right? Never a um, spatial derivative, always a time derivative here in dynamics. And then acceleration in the y direction is equal to y double dot, or we could also write that as the time rate of change of v sub y. All of these are instantaneous values, instantaneous at one snapshot in time. And it turns out that any time that we solve one of these Newtonian problems, we're looking at a snapshot of the forces that are happening, creating a snapshot of the acceleration that is happening as well. All right, so one of the ways that we can apply these equations is to friction, and hopefully you remember friction fairly well from statics. So let's talk here a little bit about friction kinetics. So in statics, all of our friction, or the majority of our friction, was static friction, which meant that there was no motion at all. Maybe we did a little bit, you've been exposed to a little bit of constant velocity friction, which then ends up having zero acceleration. So still sum of forces equal to zero, but you did need to use the kinetic friction term versus the static friction term. So just a few points of reminder that our static friction, we can label as F sub F, is equal to our mu sub S times n, mu sub s being our coefficient of a static friction, and of course n being our normal force. And then as we get into kinetic, often we label that with the same f sub f, we really just change the right hand side, and that being mu sub k times n. Okay, just swapping out that coefficient for a kinetic friction coefficient versus a static friction coefficient. And just remembering that for most materials that our mu sub s is greater than our mu sub n. So fundamentally, we can have more friction produced by static friction. Once things get moving, they can stay moving that much easier. Another thing to recall is that, so this is kind of one up here. Let's call this two as we're reviewing here. Recall that friction opposes motion, right? That's the most simple way that we can state that relationship is that friction opposes motion. A more detailed way, getting into absolute versus relative, can say that friction acts in the opposite direction to the relative or absolute motion of a body. 
Now you were exposed to this idea of relative versus absolute motion in the previous chapter as we talked about relative motion between particles. So let's see if you can apply this concept to a case study. So let's say that we have a conveyor belt system. So here are my two pulleys on this conveyor belt system. We have a belt which is wrapping around those. Let's assume that both of these are in fixed axis rotation, so they're not going anywhere. And so we have a angular velocity, omega. We could also write this if we wanted to as theta dot, time rate of change of the angular position theta, which is negative from the right-hand rule. Make sure that makes sense as you wrap your fingers around that vector putting your fingertips toward this arrowhead, you should have your thumb pointing into the screen. That's negative from the right-hand rule. And let's say that we go ahead and drop a box onto this conveyor belt. Let's say the box has a weight W. And what I'd like you to do is to create a free body diagram of the box, including friction, and also essentially the portion of the belt that it collides with. Okay, so this box here is being dropped onto the belt. And so we're gonna create two different free body diagrams. I'll go ahead and set up the bodies for you. One body would be the box. One body would be a section of that belt. Okay, so I've just basically cut out a section of that belt here to here. So these are these cut lines on the ends. Go ahead and draw those two free body diagrams to think about the interaction forces both um, on the belt and also on that box. And pay close attention to the direction of the friction. All right, coming back from your work, shouldn't be a big surprise that we would have a weight force on that box that there would be a normal force. This normal force is the normal force of the belt pushing back on the box. Therefore, we have an equal and opposite normal force here of the box pushing down on the belt. Um, we, of course, we would have some kind of a, a weight of the belt, probably fairly small if our distance was fairly small. Now let's get into this friction term. Okay, so we know that friction opposes motion. Okay, so if I look at the velocity, the velocity of the belt has to be moving from left to right because that's what direction those wheels are spinning as it moves um, across in that direction. So that is an absolute value. And then we need to take a look at the velocity of the box. Now you might be looking at the velocity of the box and say, well, that box is not moving left to right. But it turns out, because it's not moving left to right, but it's coming down here onto a moving surface, we could say the velocity of the box has a relative velocity going to the left. Okay, relative because it's relatively going in the opposite direction. This is the same phenomena that you would have if you are sitting in a car in a parking lot. And let's say you're looking down at your phone, because that's probably what you're doing if you're sitting in a parking lot and well, maybe you're looking at your phone all the time and a car pulls in next to you. When you, that car pulls in next to you, what do you feel like you're doing? You probably feel like you're rolling backwards, right? You're not rolling backwards, you're just moving relative to that car. That car is moving forwards. Relative to the car, you're moving backwards. Now relative to the ground, which is absolute, you're not moving at all, okay? But that's the idea of that relative movement. And so we, if we know that the relative motion of the box is to the left, it turns out that our friction force is going to the right. I'm going to label this F sub K as my kinetic friction as the box hits that belt, okay, moving to the right. And if you think about what this kinetic friction is doing, this kinetic friction is actually accelerating this box. I could add um, a kinetic term on here, I'll do that in purple. I have my m times a, my lateral acceleration, due to that friction, they're going in the same direction, right? Forces cause motion. In this case, friction causes motion. So it isn't always that friction, so in this case, friction is still opposing relative motion, 
but it's actually causing absolute motion. Okay, so this notion of relative to absolute is very important. The other thing that we'd see coming over to our belt is that the friction has to be equal and opposite. So here would be my F sub K, my kinetic friction going to the left. And because of that F sub K, it turns out I would end up with a different amount of tension. Call this one TS and TL, and maybe you'll remember from statics, if you studied the section on flexible belt friction, this is the same phenomena that happened there, that our F sub K is adding to our T sub S in order to equal T sub L. So T sub S is the smaller amount of tension, T sub L is the larger amount of tension. So we need to pull harder on this side than we would on this side. And what that pull is doing is it's transferring friction to the block in order to accelerate the block to get it moving to the right. Okay, so friction does oppose motion, but it can oppose either relative or absolute motion. So I hope that that gets you thinking a little bit deeper about these Newtonian kinetics relationships, about our forces, about our acceleration, about friction, right? Um, kind of deeper approach to friction and thinking about how friction really works as compared to absolute versus relative motion. And we'll follow this up with an example. Hope you're having a great day.